would you feel if due to an operation to your jaw, you can no longer speak? In your head, you are still the same thoughtful, feisty, articulate person you always were. But the people you meet think differently and treat you as mentally challenged, just based on how you look and speak. This happens to so many people. Are we that person who has treated them differently? Have we jumped to conclusions based purely on a person's outward appearance? This is Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I am Smitha Tharoor. I'd like to introduce Simone Sultana. Simone is a Bangladeshi Brit, an economist and photographer who grew up in London in the 70s. Age five, Simone, along with her family, escaped from persecution during the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War and moved to London. She grew up in a very politicized family. Her parents were influenced by the left politics of the 60s, hence her name Simone, Simone de Beauvoir. Their activism grew with the movement to liberate Bangladesh. Simone herself is married to a South African who was involved in South Africa's liberation and has spent much of her working life working in the consensus building space with different stakeholders and economic policy, gender rights, climate, and work safety. In fact, after the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh in 2013, which we all read about, and the tragic death of over 1,000 workers, Simone has been working with safety for workers on the global supply chains with some of the largest global brands and in local industry. But that's not all. She chaired BRAC UK for 10 years, was on its global board, and now on the founding governance body of BRAC, which is the world's largest development NGO, but not on usual people's radar. And you think, huh, what, BRAC? Never heard of it? Well, I wonder what that's about. Perhaps there's an unconscious bias there, because the roots of BRAC started in Bangladesh. And yet, BRAC is ranked number one in the top 100 NGOs for the last five years. So it really does make you start thinking from even that perspective. But that's not what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about all kinds of other things. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Simone's perspectives and her stories on unconscious bias. Thank you so very much for joining me, Simone. Thank you, Smita. It's a real pleasure to be here talking on this very important topic, especially now when I think others are beginning to realize the importance of this area of discussion. So when we're thinking of unconscious bias, I mean, what comes to mind to you? What does that mean to you? Well, I thought about it, Smita, knowing that I was going to come and talk to you about this. And I looked at the two words, the word unconscious. I think we all have a good common sense understanding of it. And it's really about not being aware. But at the same time, I think we also know very little about the brain and how the unconscious mind works. So with that in mind, though, I'm using it at its very core understanding what we are not aware of. In terms of the bias part, I felt that I would approach this slightly differently because I, I really feel that it assumes a truth from which we diverge. And I'm not a believer in those sort of truths, which is not to say that I don't have a, a strong sense of value and morality and a sense of what is right and wrong. That has developed over time. But in terms of the word bias, I feel it does assume point of divergence. And so unconscious bias for me is, is a constant state. If you ask, do I have unconscious biases? Is it biases, Smita, or yeah, is there a, a, a yeah. Latin a plural for that? <laughs> I feel I'm in a constant state of unconscious bias because my sense of bias comes from not knowing and not having a full set of information. And I feel I'm in a constant state of not knowing the whole. I will only have a limited view of a person, of a context, of an idea. I can always be reading more. I can always have more exposure. So whenever I enter any situation, I would assume that I have an unconscious bias. And the issue that you often talk about is how one brings it into one's conscious mind and one is aware that one is unconscious. Sorry, I, I was sorry to interrupt, but I just Not wanted sure. to, to just pick up on something that I didn't want the listeners to miss while you continue to expand on that. And I just wanted to go back to something you said much earlier on, which was the word truth and the idea of what does truth mean to us? 
Because truth to me is values, or are you saying something different? I think when I use the word truth, I'm saying that there is a truth. And I think that values are made up of a number of philosophies and understanding of the way we want the world to be, the sort of society we want to live in. And depending on one's, whether one is religious or not, you may have a different view of how one comes to that conclusion. I feel it's a work in production continuously about (laughs) the sort of world we want. As an economist, I think I do believe in information and more information informing us. But there does, of course, come a point where you begin to develop a value system and you can articulate it. Whether you get more information that develops it is another matter, but you have a sort of core sense of values. But I suppose, really, I was kind of rephrasing what you're saying or my understanding of what you're saying is the fact that I have my truth and you have your truth. And our truth influences us unconsciously to have unconscious biases. And therefore, all of us will always have unconscious biases. I'm kind of summarizing what you're saying. Am I right in that? I think you're absolutely right. And we come from very different experiences. Even in the same household, we will have different experiences and histories and exposure to different ideas and contexts. And we bring that baggage along with us as we begin to try and understand what we are living at present. And so all those data points already exist in us. And then we you know, form opinions based on that. Where I think the issue has become very relevant today is a lack of understanding that there is a lot that we don't know, an appreciation that there are different views. I think it leads us to having very strong opinions and believing that they are the truths. And usually we discuss unconscious bias in that context of people, you know, whether it's race or identity or being misinformed. And I suppose my sense is we're always in a space of being misinformed because there's always more to know. Absolutely. I so agree with you. But then what does that look like for you? Because you've had so many different, you know, just on the little brief introduction that I spoke earlier about you, you have so many varied, interesting, unusual experiences. I mean, would you be able to share a story with us? Yes, absolutely. You know, in thinking about my own unconscious bias, I'm going to be really looking at it in a sort of timeline where I have become conscious of how unconscious I was in the past about certain issues after I've sort of been more exposed to a particular area. But my work itself was very much embedded in working with different stakeholders with different views. And my work in South Africa, for example, during the transition post-apartheid liberation involved working with people who were part of the apartheid architecture, had very specific views around blacks, had a very different life experience to the people that they were about to then enter into government with. And just working with people in the same room, coming from such divergent viewpoints and lenses, was in itself a sort of wake-up call to me around how different people could be. Because I'd come from Britain where there were all kinds of race issues in the 1970s, but to go into a place where it had been institutionalized really brought it out loud and clear. I suppose I don't want to simplify it, but what was quite remarkable was that Over the years of working with groups of people coming from very different walks of life, what began was a process of dismantling those hard-held views about the other and exposure to each other and over time discussing very specific issues in a particular context, you began to see each other as human beings. And I know this sounds really obvious and contrived, but I mean, it is exactly what happened. Incredible thinkers who suddenly from being arch enemies. In one instance, I was working in an economic policy environment with somebody who had been tortured by the other person across the table. And in the space of a number of months, they were barbecuing together, laughing, having a drink and discussing issues around the future of South Africa. Oh, that's remarkable. I mean, and their views about each other and each other's color and baseless information. I mean, they were really genuinely, they believed in it. They believed in all the folklore that they'd grown up with off each other. Well, I mean, they were clearly taught by Nelson Mandela is what I was thinking. No, but I mean, I'm just finding this fascinating. But let's leave South Africa and bring you back here. Can you tell us more about stories that perhaps you've experienced in London? 
that shows unconscious bias. There are so many, Smita, and let me not talk about the race and identity issues and the gender biases that I think are very familiar to many of your listeners. And perhaps just focus on something I'm going through right now, and I know many have experienced this, and that is really talking about, I don't know the word if it's disability, but certainly let me talk about my mother. You know my mother. She's a very articulate, very elegant, very compassionate and politically motivated person. She's been working in the space of trying to get sort of the underdogs in the arts world be recognized in the mainstream for many years. And her world was about engaging with the world. Then she had cancer and some very serious reconstructive surgery done to her jaw, as a result of which she's disfigured. And can't speak properly. She mumbles effectively. I mean, we can understand her because over time we began to understand how she talks. But this for us was a very difficult thing to get through, uh, seeing our mother go through this. But it was quite interesting to see her think about her own identity because it was so much based on interacting with the outside world. And I do want to tell you that I've discussed this with her to say that I'm going to be discussing this. And she was more than happy because she would have loved to have been here articulating it herself. But what I became aware of was the the way people viewed her. And it's really brought into my mind how people who are disabled or disfigured are treated by others outside, either with pity or with compassion or with irritation and a sense that they are mentally challenged as well, which itself is a bias as well. If somebody is mentally challenged, they oughtn't be treated differently. But nevertheless, when you're in a situation where you are fully able to talk in your head, but you look different, you can't speak in the way people expect an articulate person to speak, you're treated in a really dismissive manner. And it's been absolutely horrifying to see how extensive this is. My mother call me up in this COVID period when she was in UCH having to have an emergency endoscopy. And we were worried about the COVID. But I know that what I was worried about was the way she would be treated when she wouldn't be able to answer in the way she would have had she had her speech. And she called me up and started mumbling, which I can understand, and texting me that, you know, the roughness with which she was treated by a number of people in the hospital this is a caring profession, the nursing profession, but they sort of treated her, they said, do you not know English? Was there sort of racism come, sort of possibly an ageist element to it? I don't know what was driving that sort of language. Let's just pause there because I want to just try, because I'm just so moved just hearing this and I want the listeners to capture what you're saying before we move on from it. So here is this beautiful, articulate, intelligent, vibrant woman who, because of surgery to her face because of a cancer that she had remains articulate and intelligent but she's not able to speak out and therefore she has to text and her face the beauty of her face has changed because of the actual physical disfigurement to the face because of the surgery so here is this woman who now looks different just visually but nothing else has changed within her And she is in hospital, as an example, which you've just pointed out, because she needed to go in for a sudden emergency endoscopy. And because she's not able to speak and articulate the way she used to, and because she is in her 70s, we are making an assumption here. It could be unconscious bias on your part, maybe. I'm just deliberately kind of throwing it out there. But she's in her 70s. She is of a person of color because she's Bangladeshi. She's brown skin. She has a clearly disfigured face, and she's not able to speak coherently for us to understand. And as a result, the people who are in a caring profession don't give her the care that she would have got if she didn't have these issues. Isn't that what you're saying? Absolutely. Beautifully articulated. My mother herself has articulated to me that she has been in these sort of scenarios enough times to know that it was her disfigurement and her inability to talk and articulate her concerns appropriately that has led to that view. Not that one can ever say why people behave in a particular way in a particular situation. You know my mother, she's quite a feisty woman. So 
she hasn't lost that. And she really built up the courage to, in her way, ask the woman, why are you behaving like this? Why are you talking to me in that tone, in that pidgin English, in that, you know, I've told you what my scenario is. I've texted and written it on my phone that I'm in a scenario where I can't talk because of surgery. And you nevertheless, you've got a tone and a very sort of condescending tone and dismissive tone. And so why is that? The woman was very embarrassed. So there was a situation where my mother actually did raise those issues and her behavior completely changed. And it's very much about also not tolerating this sort of behavior and standing up for yourself. And she did do that. But there's only so much you can do. And after a while, I'm seeing my mother over time slowly lose the will to have those engagements and retreat into a different world, which is not engaging with other people, but engaging through words on screen and writing and communicating through those means. But I feel a sort of level of anger that why should that be? It's, it's because of the way other people view her and they don't see her as the person she is. I'm trying to think of this for a bigger picture, not just about your mother, but about what that means to us as human beings when we are fundamentally who we are and then something happens that makes us visually look different or cannot speak or something. And then what does that do? Because society... And stereotypical expectations, and this is what we mean by unconscious bias, because stereotypically people look whatever normal is in inverted commas, and we look at human beings and we, you know, we see two eyes, nose, mouth, so on, open their mouth, we understand what they're saying, and suddenly in this instance, we are unable to do that. And in fact, it brings to mind an interview I had done last year with a photographer, Giles Dooley, who went to Afghanistan and landed on a mine and lost three limbs. and. As far as he's concerned, he's still the same person. But he shares a story of when he's out in a restaurant on a date and the the waiter decides to be kind to him and cuts up his food before he brings (gasps) it to the table. Oh, gosh. But I mean, that that was a kindness that was deeply hurtful. Yes. On the other hand, you've got someone else, say a nurse in a hospital looking at your mother, Rooney Khan, we should name the lady, and treating her like somebody who does not have intelligence purely because she's not able to mouth the words that she is actually very good at articulating in the written word. And of course, one has to also think, I mean, you know, my mother, of course, also thought, you know, they're under pressure. It's COVID. We fully understand what the nursing profession has had to face. So, you know, one has to always think about what the person perpetrating that sort of attitude, where they are coming from. But it it is, I think, something that I, you know, in terms of the the bias around disfigurement, it's interesting. I pivot to a a story that I experienced, and you asked me about my own unconscious bias. I recall very strongly, because every time I experience my mother's situation like this, I think about my own self a number of years ago when I was doing a photography shoot of women who had survived acid violence and acid attacks on their face. And I went in there to produce a set of photographs for a campaign around uh, violence against women. I went in there with a very strong context in which I was going to take these photographs and really wanted to, to tell the story about how women are affected by one of the most extreme forms of violence. But something that I had a view about and a view about how I was going to capture it on photographs in order to tell this story towards this campaign. When I sat for a number of days with the woman, I was completely flabbergasted because I had to completely rethink my approach to this because I would return home from these shoots and I would get asked by the people who knew I was going to be working with a lot of women who had been very, very severely disfigured. They would ask me, oh, how was it? You know, in these sort of grave tones, it must have been really difficult. And I would feel this anxiety because, in fact, I would leave the session with the women on a high. And this was because the group that I was working with had been dealing with their disfigurement for a number of years. And the spirit of humanity came out that they did not identify themselves as disfigured women. And in fact, when I wanted to take the photographs, they 
were so excited about having their portraits taken. They got their makeup kits out. This was in Bangladesh, by the way. One suggested we go to the roof garden and they wanted to have flowers. And it was really being orchestrated by them as a Bollywood shoot. And I had, of course, imagined myself taking very strong, linear black and white photographs. Um, and, and that's what I went in. That was my own, my view of this. Your unconscious bias. Oh, yeah. This is a serious matter. We've got to have serious photographs. And they're saying, come on, let's get the Bollywood music. And, and, and they, were, they said exactly what my mother said, which is that the disability they have more than anything is going out and the way people view them and that they get shunned or that people feel overly pitiful and, you know, symbolically cutting up the food and, you know, overly helpful. It's just not a normal way of behaving. And that for them is their disability now. Well, I mean, in fact, if you come back to what you were saying about Bruni Khan, about your mother, and the fact that you say that she is beginning to possibly give up and trying to be the person she is, which is about engaging and helping other people see different perspectives. She's thinking, what's the point? And retreating in a way. And what does that say then about, about human beings are like her, like Rooney, like the ladies who you took on a photo shoot, had not retreated, they'd chosen not to. So what are we taking away from that example? Well, I think that, you know, it's really questioning who we are as human beings. And I I'm not sure, I'm on the fence around, are we essentially cruel creatures or are we compassionate creatures? I think the more we get exposed to, the less we are biased in the way where it's posing a judgment on the notion of bias. I think that people become kinder when they have family members who go through cancer or have Parkinsonian dementia something else that I discovered. When oneself becomes 50 plus, you realize that the thing that you face is the generation above having all kinds of illnesses and the way that they are viewed by the outside world as non-productive individuals. And my father, who had Parkinsonian dementia, lost the movement of his muscles. When he talked to people, he couldn't express. We're unaware how we talk with our faces. And because of that, people treated him again And he was a sort of Sufi philosopher and, you know, was really very articulate. And people would just talk to him in three words just to talk down to him like a child. And of course, one shouldn't talk to a child like that either. But the point being that I think the more exposure we have, the more we allow old people and people who have been disfigured to be part of society, the more we allow that sort of exposure you know, immigration in London has been one of the biggest breakers of this understanding of other ethnicities. If you live in different areas and are exposed to different socioeconomic backgrounds, then the exposure itself begins to break down those barriers. But the point is, Mita, we don't all seek that out. And I think for me, the issue is that if one thing we can do is just getting people to read and open their eyes more to other views, and in this age of social media, where we are getting fed the sort of news we want to read, I think we're becoming more and more polarized. And as an economist, I sort of feel data is incredibly valuable in allowing you to form opinions. But you also need to be able to critically think about the data you're receiving. And going back to the conversation we had, what we were discussing earlier about truths, I think a truth is made up of so many components of information. I'm not sure there is one truth, but I hope that all of these data points lead to a certainly a value system. And that's also quite a gray area, but we should be able to articulate it with evidence as to why we believe this sort of society is better and then provide evidence around it in an informed manner. That's brilliant. That's so beautifully said. I'm just trying to capture the essence of what you're saying. One is, of course, if we can, post-COVID, of course, if we can travel, and we don't need to be rich people to travel, even on a budget, to be able to see different parts of the world, to appreciate that there are people going from one country to another. You know, London alone, where you and I live, is a melting pot of so many different cultures and ethnicities. But then also look at the data you're saying. Now, that's interesting. There are multiple truths. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. And on multiple ideas as well, Mita, I think that data gives a sense of sort of a point of information. I think 
that if we spent more time talking about ideas and value systems and the sort of society we want to live in, we are now so in a soundbite culture that the sort of data we want, we want it quick and fast and easy. And really, if you want a rich society, you need to put in and you need to think about things and you need to understand things. And that does involve more than sitting and watching a Netflix series. You do need to think about it. You do need to discuss things. You do need to read. And we have centuries worth of information at our hands. And we really don't find time to do the sort of work we should as individuals to make this world a more thoughtfully choreographed place rather than one where we have existing inequalities and the powerful manage to control media and the way we think. I think we have it all in our power to actually be more informed and we should need to want to do it. And as much about data and being informed with information as about ideas and thought processes and critical thinking and how we manage that data. That's beautiful. I actually want to end here, but I won't because I want to give Rooney Khan, your mother, the last word. Now, if she were here and I were asking her and I'm asking you to speak on her behalf, what do you think you would do, Rooney, to manage unconscious biases from other people and your own, considering where you are right now? What would she say? I feel very humble that you asked me that because I think my mother is so much more articulate than me, as you know. But I think she would request people to give time, both with compassion, but not with any sort of a note of patronizing, but to give time to people, whether they're old or whether they're disfigured, whether they're disabled, whether they can't speak English because they've just arrived from Yemen. Everyone has stories and we need to find a way to communicate. One of the best ways, of course, for those who can speak is to learn languages. She was a real believer in pulling communities together and she would just, I assume, ask people to give time and effort and think about any potential bias they might have in their head when they see someone and make assumptions. That's wonderful. So I'd like to thank Rooney Khan for her wise words. And I would like to thank you, Simone Sultana, for sharing so many different stories, including the story of your mother, because that is so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your stories of unconscious bias. Thank you, Smitha. Really pleasure to be here. so much for listening. I have been told that this podcast is ranked in the top 3% globally and heard by people in 98 countries. Thank you, listener, wherever you are, whether it's Albania, Afghanistan, Nigeria or Nepal, Sweden or Saudi Arabia. We could not have this podcast without you, the listener. As always, if you like this episode, please do share. I would also like to thank Jack Godfrey for his original music for season six. 